Hello, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the brain, specifically how the brain protects itself. Fun fact is that the brain requires about 20% of the total oxygen consumed in the body. It's composed of gray matter and white matter. The gray matter is on the outside, gives it a grayish tinge, and that's because it's composed of mostly neuronal cell bodies. That's where the cells are, the bodies. And then the white matter is on the inside, and that's composed of the neuronal axons and then the myelin. So you have a lot of fat, that's why it makes it white. Protecting the brain, giving it a case, are the three meningeal layers. You have the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. There. And they basically have a function of protecting it and then helping with fluid flow, especially the arachnoid mater here. So the dura mater is actually split into two different uh, layers, sublayers. There is the peritoneal layer, which anchors it to the skull, and then the meningeal layer, which acts more like actual dura mater. The arachnoid layer is what we're interested in, specifically the subarachnoid space, which is shown by this arrow right here. And this is where the cerebral spinal fluid is going to flow, or not going to, it does flow. Next, I just want to give you a quick rundown. There are four types of cells that are specific to neurons, to brain tissue. And they are actually referred to as neuroglia. These are different from actual neurons in that they can grow and divide. So without further ado, the first one is microglia. Glia. These are from the bone marrow, and then they go to the brain, and they phagocytize, phago cytize cellular debris and damaged tissue. Next we have oligodendrocytes. If you've heard of dendrocytes, if you have heard of shoot, I can't spell. If you've heard of Schwann cells making myelin sheets, that's in the peripheral nervous system. So these myelinate things in the central nervous system. CNS neurons and it's different and the way it does it here is that it's more like an octopus so it stretches out little arms that myelinate various neurons whereas in the PNS with Schwann cells they're more of like corn dogs I guess you would say. Next we have ependymal cells, ependymal cells. These line the ventricles slash the spinal canal and these make up the epithelial cord plexus that produces the actual cerebral spinal fluid. So I'll just put epithelial cells, choroid plexus, CSF. We'll talk about that later. And then last is astrocytes. There's not enough room to do this justice, but let's see if I can make some space here. And I'll actually make these all a little bit smaller. Hopefully you can still see astrocytes. So they help form the blood-brain barrier. Actually, I spotted out blood-brain barrier and maintain appropriate environment for action potentials as well as assist in memory and learning. And they do that in memory and learning by helping form the synapses that help you make those memories and, and learn things. So these are the four types of cells and as you can see especially with um, with these ones and then these ones these are really helpful for protecting the brain. Now we're actually going to talk about the flow of the CSF. So what is cerebral spinal fluid itself? Well just a few things here. So cerebrospinal fluid CSF. So it's ultra filtered plasma. Plasma. So you know it's already going to be pretty watery. And it really just has a bunch of salts and nutrients in it, but not a whole lot in it. Okay. And the reason is that it's supposed to protect the brain and the spinal column against concussions and stuff. It's kind of a, a shock absorber, if you will. It also removes waste, waste from metabolism and substances 
that diffuse into the brain from the blood. So it has two functions here, protection and then removing waste. And the flow is, remember I said it comes from that chloride plexus. So the flow is that you have the lateral ventricles here, follow these arrows. So it goes out here, down, there are two lateral, lateral ventricles, down to the third ventricle here, and then the fourth ventricle here, and then they go out into the subarachnoid space. That's why I talked about the subarachnoid space especially. And it's going to flow out all the way and then seep through these arachnoid granulations. And then finally end up here in the venous sinuses, also called the dural sinuses. So that's the circuit that we're looking at for the CSF. Now we're going to talk about the blood-brain barrier. Remember that it's made of of number one, the astrocytes that cover endothelial cells. Number two, the endothelial cells surrounding the brain capillaries. And then number three, tight junctions between the endothelial cells. Okay. The whole point, we have this really system of tight barriers and keeping everything out is that you really want to protect against bloodborne pathogens bloodborne pathogens toxins heavy metals heavy metals whatever all kinds of stuff that it wants to protect from however hydrophobic things so lipids fats can cross through so hydrophobic substances can cross through as well as H2O, O2, and CO2. And via special transporters, glucose can also enter. That's why glucose is consumed really heavily by the brain. Enter via special transport. And so like I mentioned, the whole point is that it wants to keep out bad stuff. But the problem with the blood brain barrier is that it also keeps out good stuff. And one example is dopamine that can help you with a variety of diseases, but you can't administer it. So for Parkinson's, you can't just give people dopamine because they can't get through the blood brain barrier. Luckily, you can give patients L-DOPA, which is a precursor. And then that enters through the blood brain barrier and is then broken down inside or not broken down is transformed into dopamine and then can be utilized by the proper receptors. So here in these pictures, you can see the astrocyte foot processes that stabilize this barrier and along with the tight junctions, keeps all the bad stuff out.